Well, welcome to Central, where it's okay to not be okay. I'm Nikki, and thank you for watching this experience today. Be sure to connect with us by dropping a comment below, or you can always go to central.family for events going on right now. Now, don't forget, we go live every weekend right here on YouTube, so you can hit that subscribe button and get notifications for when we go live and when we upload new content. For now, we have an incredible experience in store for you, so check it out. Well, welcome to Central. We're so glad that you're here this weekend. Let's all worship together. Come on. You're indescribable in every way. Search me out now. I'm caught up in your grace. I heard my name across the ocean. Pull me closer. The current change. You show me life. A new horizon. Silver light. A brand new day. Continue to sing together. Sing this with me. I was born a rebel, fighting for a dream. But when I lost the battle, the walls came down on me. Then you stole my heart and released me with a cause. And out of my rebellion, I slid to Tyranny began a revolution. Oh, to bring me to my knees, found my life when I found the power to withdraw. If you feel comfortable, just lift your hands and declare this chorus together. 
together, come on. So I in San Diego, California. Seventh grade, um, I was at a friend's house and uh, he got into his dad's liquor cabinet and, uh, and I took a drink off that whiskey and I took another drink off that whiskey. Moderation was never one of my better qualities. Blackout drinking would just become normal. I started to go to college when I got expelled from Continuation High School. My grandparents, they fed me a solid, steady diet of resources, cars and money and, and the ability to go to school. And so I basically majored in deceiving my grandparents and taking money from them. And one evening while I was living at the coast, my phone rang and it was my grandpa. He told me he wanted me to talk to my grandma. And it was weird looking back on it because he told me he wanted me to say goodbye to my grandma put my grandma on the phone and my dog ran out the front door and uh, and I hung up on her basically. I don't know if I even told her that I loved her. But uh, that night my grandfather decided that it was the end of the road and uh, he, he shot my grandmother and then uh, he killed himself. I felt very guilty that I wasn't there for him and that he felt like this was his only choice. The well, first time I was married, I was married for only 18 months. Drugs and alcohol were predominant. Um, I got married to my second wife, and um, that marriage um, lasted for about 13 years, 14 years. In August of 2008, I was packing a U-Haul for, of all places, Las Vegas, Nevada. I had started a relationship with uh, my current wife, and um, 
We led the Vegas lifestyle. Literally, our, our family was in the bar. But in January of 2015, um, I woke up at five o'clock on a Sunday morning and um, I just knew that I needed to go to church. And we, we, um, we went to Central. And so I went and found a parking spot I, and I parked the car and I looked up on the side of the building and there's this huge sign and it said, it's okay not to be okay. And I sat there just kind of fighting back tears. Because it's like, you have no idea what just pulled into your parking lot. We walked in, and uh, man, when the bass line hit, and I heard the music, it was just like, I don't know how to explain it, other than tell you I knew I was home. That same kind of experience would happen every time we'd go back. I fought the want to drink and the desire to, to, to use or to smoke. I read uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which says something to the extent of, while you'll be faced with all these different trials, God will always give you a way out. I can tell you that it's true that God did for me what I was incapable of doing for myself. He healed and fixed things in me that I, I never thought would change. And that it's through his love and grace that uh, I get to be a, a better man. Ryan's story is incredible. So grateful for he and his wife, Michelle. They're ministry partners here. They're making a huge impact in people's lives. And we are so thankful for his transformation. Hey, help me welcome Cindy this weekend to the stage, will you? Can't wait for you to learn and meet her. She's an incredible lady who has this spirit of generosity that just oozes out of every part of her life. She gives her best life to serve God. She grew up in church and was baptized at nine years old as a young girl and uh, lived her life for God, not always like 100% in, but uh, she is incredible. She taught generosity at our First Step seminar yesterday. She lives out generosity in her life. She models everything that we hope every person that attends Central would become. And, you know, when you think of her life in total, you think, oh, yeah, it's no wonder she's just had it, had it easy. No, 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 no. Listen, five years ago, in a span of five months, she lost her husband, her father, and her best friend. And most people going through that type of grief, they were just thrown in the towel. They've been sidelined. They're just going to give up but not Cindy. God told her that he'd created her for a purpose. He had a wonderful plan for her life, and she just continued to move forward with dedication, started her own business. God's hand of favor has been on it because she knew that she was to be blessed to be a blessing, and that was her purpose in life. So would you help me welcome Cindy one more time? <laughs> Cindy, I love your story. I love what God's done in your life. It's incredible. And what would you say is the moment that it all started making sense to you, this idea of generosity to live out your life for God in that way? Well, like, like you said, I was baptized when I was nine. I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a church organist. My mom was a choir director. I was in youth group. So in, in my early years and through my teen years, really involved in church. And you know, like a lot of people, you turn 20, 25, you get, you get into the situation where you feel like, no, I can do this on my own. I don't need any help. And so even though I was a Christian, I've, I've kind of fell away. I call myself, maybe it's called the convenient Christian. Um, but when my husband passed away, he had a double lung transplant in 2004, but when he passed away in 2016, and then I lost my dad, the real turning point was my dad's memorial service back in Maryland. And this gentleman walked up to me, and my dad was a teacher. He started in 1960. And this gentleman walked up to me, and he said, you know, your dad was my English teacher. And I remember him because he made such an impact on my life. Hmm. And without his impact and his teaching and his just pouring into us as a teacher, I don't think I'd be here where I am today. 
And that just blew me away. I'm thinking, I always knew my dad was generous. I knew my dad had a huge heart. So did my mother, they, he, she was a nurse. But at that moment, I thought, my dad emulated generosity. He emulated tithing. He emulated Malachi 310 all the time. And I said, I, I have to do the same. So all into Central. Um, of course, the grief was tough, um, but you practice uh, Psalm 23, where it says you walk through the valley. And I have to say, the community of this church was awesome. I, the, the care team here was awesome. It helped me get through that part of my hard part of my journey, but all in on Financial Peace University, all in on legacy, all in on ministry partnership, all in on volunteering, and I can't imagine not doing what I do with this church because of what how God's blessed me. Wow, and you have been used greatly through your sharing of your life and blessing, Cindy. We want you to know that. It's just <laughs> incredible. Yeah. And, uh, I know great days are ahead because God's going to use you to impact more lives. So thank, thank you for your gift of generosity. Thank you for pouring your best life for the benefit of others. You truly exemplify that you're blessed to be a blessing. Help me celebrate Cindy, will you, church? <laughs> so good. Well, all of us have to make that choice as Cindy had to make when she learned about her father's generosity. She had to choose, am I gonna live that kind of life or not? And she chose to be a blessing. She made that choice and God has been blessing her ever since. It's incredible. And you and I have that choice and we can be a blessing. That's why when we come to this time where we talk about how we can give financially, we have that choice. And right now we're asking you to choose to be a blessing. Be a blessing through our Feed the City initiative. What's Feed the City? We're asking you to give $35 to feed a family for an entire week. We have over 300,000 people right here in the city of Las Vegas that have food insecurities. Many of these families living on one meal a day. So we're asking you to give $35 so we can continue these relief efforts in people's lives. And on Saturday, May 8th, we're gonna have a special day, a day that we're calling the drop, where we're hoping to bless thousands of these families that are living on one meal a day. It's easy to give. You can give at the end of our experience. Our ushers will have offering buckets so you can give by check or cash or walk up to one of our generosity team members wearing the red apron. Tell them how many families you want to sponsor at $35 or take your credit or your debit card. Or you can give online at central.family or centralonline.tv. But thank you. Thank you for allowing us to impact people, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to cover this city with hope and love through your generosity. God is using you to make a huge impact. Well, let's go to him in prayer. Will you join me? Well, Father, we love you. We cannot thank you enough right now for how good you are. You take care of us. You are for us. You never leave us. You love us. You know our needs and you want to be a part of our lives. So thank you, Jesus, for being all of those things to us and more. God, thank you for protecting us and guiding us and providing for us so we can provide for other people. And as we give our gifts, may they know that you love them in a special way. And God, all of us, we're here because we don't want to play games any longer with our life. We want it to count, and we want it to count for you. So we pray you'd show up and speak to us and be real to us today, Jesus, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
yourself. Come on and sing this out. prayer for you today that you will experience God's peace and joy in your life. I've shared this story before, but this song is actually a scripture from the book of Numbers. And last year I was on my way home from Kingman, Arizona, and I have a friend that lives there. We have a central church location down there too, and they attend. His name is Josh, and Josh just asked, hey, we're building a new house down here in Kingman. Would you mind stopping by and just saying a blessing over the home and writing a scripture on the wall? So I show up to the house, and Josh isn't there, but there's three guys working on it. And it's just the frame of the home, and 
I went in and I told him I'm gonna write a scripture on the wall. I don't wanna freak him out. Why is this guy here vandalizing the house? And so I went in and I quickly realized that these individuals don't speak English. And so I got up my phone and I told him, I'm gonna write a prayer and a scripture on the wall. And the guy grabs a ladder and he takes it to the door frame of the house. And he says, write it up here, right here. So I get on the ladder and I write this verse, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And I get down off the ladder and he's asking me a question. And he pulls out his phone and he says, what verse is that? And so I show him in, in scripture and I, I translate it to Spanish and he just begins weeping in this moment. And he's asking me another question and he types it into Google Translate and it says, would you please pray for me and my construction crew? So right there in the home, we gathered together, we put arms around each other and I said a prayer for these individuals and they may not have understood a single word that I said, but God knows what's going on in their hearts. He knows the challenges they're up against and I believe that God heard those prayers and the, those men received the blessing that day of just being prayed over and I believe that God wants to say a blessing over your life too. And so I wanna say a prayer, and if you're going through anything as a church family today, we wanna to pray for you and with you. If we can pray for you, would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air if you need prayer of any sorts, whatever you're going through. And if you're next to somebody with their hand raised, I wanna encourage you to just do this. Stretch a hand out towards them, you don't have to touch them. Let's just ask God to do what only he can do. God, we love you so much. We thank you for our church family. Thank you for being a good God, for loving us as we are. I pray for those in the room today who, who feel challenged, who feel up against the wall. Lord, that you would meet us in this very moment. Lord, that you would take control of this situation as we surrender it to you. God, give us a sense of your presence in our lives. May we trade our sorrow, our anxiety, our fear, our depression for your joy, for your peace. God, we love you and we thank you. For it's in your name we pray. And every person in this room said together, amen. with me, church. I'm caught up in your presence, and I just want to sit here at your feet, and I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want Oh, 
your prayer today. I just want you and nothing else. And nothing else. And nothing else will do. I just want you. Sing it out. Come on. And nothing. Nothing else will do. I just want you to see, and nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you to see, nothing else. Nothing. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you today. Thank you for being with us. And we are talking about the comeback. You know, I was thinking this week about just the home that I was raised in. I don't know what you imagine when you think of your childhood home, but I primarily lived in one house as a kid growing up. And uh, I went and pulled it up on a random real estate website because it's been through, it's been sold a few times since I lived there. But this is a more modern picture of the house that I grew up in, in this mid-sized sort of Texas town. This was the yard that I had to mow on the weekends. Thanks, Dad. This was uh, the driveway where I learned how to roller skate. I learned how to ride a bike. I learned how to work on my very first car, a old Buick Skylark. Come on for the Buicks. This was the window that, uh, to my bedroom, and um, so, which wasn't very wise from my parents' standpoint, but I snuck out of this window so many times I couldn't even count in the middle of the night. Went roaming, exploring, jumped in cars, did the whole thing. Um, but I was thinking about my home because my dad had built in the back of the house uh, something that was very typical for these kinds of homes in Texas because we were in an area called Tornado Alley. And so the tornadoes would come through. And when the tornadoes come, you need to have a place to go. So he had a cellar built, almost like an underground bunker. And I actually found it on this real estate site. Like, like this is where we would go if there was a tornado. Now, this is a really clean picture from a, you know, years later when they were trying to sell the house. <laughs> what I remember is spider webs. Dirt, lots of stuff, canned goods. You know, my, my parents were Great Depression uh, kids, and so uh, we always had canned goods like, you know, we could all starve at any given moment. Even though you'd want to before you'd eat some of those canned goods, they were so old. When the tornadoes would come, we would all go down into the, the bunker, into the, into the cellar, and we'd have a little transistor radio, and we'd listen to the weather report, you know, like where the tornadoes were touching down, how close they were. You'd, you'd hear the, the rain or the hail hitting that metal roof of the little underground cellar, you know, and I, I remember there were times where we'd have to be down there for hours and hours. Sometimes I would fall asleep, and when the tornadoes had finally passed, my parents would wake me up, and they'd be like, all right, we can go up now. The storm is over. And so we go up. My dad would open that cellar door, and I'd go up those steps, and, and I'd be a little hesitant, right? I was just waking up, and if the sun was still out, my eyes would be adjusting, and I'd sort of step out like, is everything okay? You know, is the house still standing? 
How, how many branches are in the yard? Am I going to have to clean those up? Right? I'm just sort of assessing things because we'd been in survival mode and now we were coming back to the surface. And the reason I tell you that story, I was thinking about that bunker today because this last year we've spent some time in the bunker, right? We spent some time in our own bunkers. <laughs> in our own. Some of us have been in survival mode with unemployment, with financial challenges, with issues going on in our family, certainly with COVID and restrictions. Most of us have at least spent some time sort of in the bunker. Now, some people didn't go in the bunker at all. But most of us have been impacted at some level. And while I don't want to suggest the storm is over, I want to suggest to you today that it is time to start climbing the stairs and coming out of survival mode and moving into comeback mode. It's time to start dreaming again if you're not. It's time to start thinking about the future again, if you're not. It's time to move past just getting through the days without anything happening to dreaming about tomorrow and what God has for us. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, the, the verse that God has laid on my heart over the last year that I've come back to again and again and again, it's my, my kind of verse of the year, is Isaiah 43. In verse 18 and 19, God um, speaks to the Israelite people through the prophet Isaiah. And uh, he says something really powerful. When we get to the red word, I'll just ask you to say this out loud here with me. But, but this is the verse. He says, but forget all that. They had been through some traumatic stuff. They had been in survival mode. God, he says, forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I am going to do. And then he says, for I am about to do something what? New. new. Turn to the person next to you and say, God's going to do something new. God is always moving, he's always working. And here he says to the Israelite people, I'm gonna do something new. He says, see, I've already begun. Do you not see it? All this year I've been praying, God, give me the eyes to see it. God, give me the, the heart to see it. Let me see where you're working. Let me see what you're doing. He says, I'll make a pathway through the wilderness. I'll create rivers in the dry wasteland. God is moving and he's working. If we'll only have the eyes to see you know, when my kids were little, we would play something called slug bug. Anybody play slug bug, you know, with your family? Like, like here's, a, here's what slug bug's all about. You, you look for the Volkswagen Beetle or the bug, and whoever sees the first Volkswagen Beetle, they call it out, you know, red slug bug. And then whoever calls it out, they get to slug somebody. Except, you know, in our car, it was always gently and with no hitbacks. Here's what I noticed playing slug bug. If you would have asked me before we started playing, I would have said, like, there, there, there's not enough beetles on the road to play slug bug, y'all. There's, they're not, they're, you know, I haven't seen a beetle in years. But then when you start playing the game, you realize they're everywhere. It, isn't it true? Like, around every corner, there's a slug bug. Who knew there were this many bugs on the road? I don't know. But the dynamic is true. What you look for is what you tend to find. And spiritually in your life, if you will start to pray this prayer, just join me in praying this prayer. God, just help me see the new things you're doing. Help me see what I need to learn. Help me see opportunities that you have for me. If you'll pray that every day, here's what will happen. You'll start looking for it, just like when you were looking for a beetle playing slug bug. And all of a sudden, you'll start seeing God opening up opportunities all around you because he's moving and he's working. Psalm chapter 90, beginning in verse 12, is a really powerful verse. And the psalmist breaks it down, and, and he says this. He says, teach us to what? Number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, you, we can't literally number our days, because none of us knows how many days we have. Only God knows that. But the principle here is this. Realize that life on earth is a limited, short supply thing. It doesn't go forever. We, we only have a season that we're here. And he's saying, God, give us the wisdom to recognize that and then to live in light of that. Number your days so that you make the most of your days. So I want to talk to you today 
couple simple thoughts about how we can dream again, come out of the survival bunker in our lives, number our days so that we make the most of our days. First thought is this, to make the most of your current season. Some of us don't think about it, but, but we are all in a season in our lives, certain seasons. Uh, this year, my daughter was home from college with all the things going on and homeschool, uh, uh, online school, uh, all the way through February of this last year. And then her college in California opened up. We were able to take her back to school. And, um, you know, she jumped in. It was a late start to the semester, but, but we were thrilled for her with that. But when I got back home, I walked back into her bedroom and I just completely lost it again. I already did this once, y'all, when we first took her to college, right? And now I'm back in her bedroom again. I'm like, man, I'm doing this twice. What's wrong with me? And I just had this sense that, wow, I just felt like, what if this was the last time that I'm going to have both my kids under our roof for an entire year, and I feel like I kind of missed it with all the things going on. And my wife, you know, in the, only, the way that only she can, she came up to me and she goes, you know, you can't be too hard on yourself because we were in a season last year. And it was a season of crisis. And if you've ever led anything in a season of crisis, it's all consuming. All you, got, all you can do in a season of crisis is get through the crisis, right? It takes everything that you have to get through the crisis. We'll have other seasons, God willing, where we'll have more family time. But that was a season. It's powerful to think of your life in seasons. You know, a lot of people say we should just be balanced. Everything needs to be balanced in your life, you know. You should just be physically balanced and spiritually balanced and family balanced and time balanced, career balanced, growth balanced. I don't know how, I don't know how people have all this time to be balanced. But I think it's way more healthy to think about life in seasons because seasons aren't necessarily perfectly balanced but you can follow certain seasons with other seasons. For instance, some of you are in a season of, of, of building and launching. You're launching a company. You're, you, you have an entrepreneurial idea, and now you're kind of going down that road. Uh, you're turning your, the, the challenge of unemployment into a blessing as you launch a new company and do a new thing. When you're launching something new, when you're starting something, it's all consuming. It's hard to run a startup and be balanced, right? But it's a season. You just have to make sure that that season eventually shifts and changes or eventually you'll burn out. Um, and some of you are in a season of preparing. You're going to school. You're trying to learn a new trade. Uh, you know, you're, you're pouring yourself into different materials. It's a season. I remember when I was in school, I just, I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to serve in ministry and I just wanted to get to the work. I was so frustrated. I wanted to get out of school and get to the work. But I had all this work and then I had a job and I had all these things and there was no time. I tried to volunteer in a church. I couldn't do all the things that I wanted to do and I just felt like I was kind of failing all the time because I couldn't get to the work. And I had a professor come along one day and goes, Judd, you're just, you're you're in a season. Right now, your role is to study. Your role is to prepare. There'll be plenty of work the rest of your life. Boy, was he right. <laughs> right? But at the time, I was just so ready to go. Some of you, you're just, you're in a season of preparing, but you're so ready to go. Just take a breath. Now's the time for you to pour in and learn and develop tools that you'll have for the rest of your life. Some of you are in a season of growing. You're growing your family. You're growing your marriage. You're growing your home. It's busy. It's crazy. Just acknowledge the season that you're in. Some of you are in a season of giving where now you're at a place where maybe things aren't so stressful and you've accomplished a lot of your earlier goals in life and now you're, you're giving back to others. You're giving back to your kids. You're giving back to your grandkids. You're, you're pouring in to others. I don't know what season you're in, but it's powerful, I think, to think about life from the framework of seasons. And just ask yourself, not only what time is it, we always ask like, hey man, what time is it? What time you got? But ask, what is the purpose of this time? What is the purpose of this season? Um, and then when you think about your purpose or your season, then you can start thinking about some things that you want to accomplish in this season of your life. Because you're going to want to accomplish some different things in your 70s than you are in your 20s. You're in a different season, right? You're going to want to accomplish different things in your, in your 30s than you are in your 60s. You're in a different season. What season are you in? 
And then I think it's helpful to write down your dreams. And this is what I want to encourage you to think about. Uh, they say that you're 42% more likely to actually do your dreams if you write them down, just by writing them down, 42%. That's, not, that's almost half, just by writing it down. First thing you might think about is this, th things I want to accomplish. You know, what, what, what do you want to accomplish uh, going forward? What are some goals you have? Maybe career goals, maybe financial goals, entrepreneurial kind of goals. What do you want to accomplish? Here's another category, and that would be way, ways I want to grow. Maybe you want to read the Bible in a year. Maybe you want to jump into Central Academy, our, our training ground where you can learn and grow spiritually. That starts this coming August, um, August 20th, uh, I think around August 23rd. But, but the way that you could jump in and grow and allow God to move in your life. Maybe there's some books you want to read. Maybe you want to learn a new trade. Maybe yeah, I don't know what it is, but how, how do you want to grow? Maybe it's, it's um, uh, health-related kinds of things. How do you want to grow? Uh, here's, here's another category, people I want to know. You know who do you want to meet? Uh, maybe it's family members, maybe it's kind of distant family or people you'd like to get to know better. Maybe it's famous people, maybe it's people in your career path that are amazing and talented. Um, it's okay to brainstorm and say, hey, these are some people I would love to know. Uh, I just, if you don't plan it and you don't write it down, it's gonna be e even less likely that, you're, that that's ever actually gonna happen. So here's some people you wanna know. And here's another thought, a lot of people have got this one right now, places I want to go. People are like, oh, I'm out of the bunker, baby. I'm traveling. When are they opening up all those international borders? I'm out. I saw a whole article called Revenge Travel. People are like, take this, COVID. I'm going all over the world. But you know, it's okay to write down places you want to go and then lay that before God. Here's what I believe. If you will look forward, that will keep you moving forward. A lot of us haven't been looking forward enough this last year. It's time to look forward so that we move forward. What are you dreaming about? I talked to my brother on Friday. My oldest brother is 17 years older than me. Amazing human being, but he has been through some incredible health challenges the last several years in his life. Um, he has, he's had diabetes for a long time and then that created uh, complexities with his liver and his liver began to fail and eventually um, it would, his liver wouldn't function right so certain toxins would, would remain in his blood that would get elevated and he couldn't think clearly, he couldn't really focus very well, he wasn't able to work anymore, he's pretty much um, homebound. I mean if you, literally he was falling asleep all the time, he was always exhausted and eventually it got so bad that he was put on the liver transplant list. And we knew if he didn't get a liver, you know, he wasn't gonna last very long. Then on top of all that, he slipped and fell on the ice and he cracked his knee. So he couldn't really walk and um, he went to the knee doctor and the knee doctor said, well, we'd love to operate on your knee and fix it, except we don't think you'd live through the operation. You gotta get the liver fixed, and then after the liver gets fixed and all that's squared away, if your heart's strong enough, then we'll operate on your knees. So here's my brother. He can't really function, he can't work, he can't drive, he can't walk, except for hobbling along with a walker. Um, and he's on the transplant list, and literally, he's in potentially the last season of his life. So I call my family, and I check on him, and this is the story they would tell me. They would give me the facts, right? But when I'd call my brother, Jim, and check on him, I'd say, Jim, how are you? He'd say, I'm good. <laughs> Always the same, I'm good. He'd say, I can't complain. God's been faithful to me. I remember, and I remember I'd be like, oh my gosh, I love that. But bro, you can't walk, can't drive, can't function in and out of the hospitals all the time, and you're gonna die. Wow. And then he'd start telling me about his dream. He'd say, uh, three years ago, I remember he told me, he goes, hey, eventually when I get this transplant done, um, and then I rehab that, and I'll get through that, then I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna get my knee operated on. Once I get my knee operated on and I rehab that, then I'll be able to walk, get around. And uh, his son, my nephew, has, lives in Wyoming, and. They've got several kids, little kids, and he's like, so when all that gets squared away, because I can't work anymore, so we're going to buy an old camper, and we're going to go to Wyoming in the summer, and we're going to spend our summers in Wyoming driving around, and we'll stay with my son a little bit, but we'll stay in the camper to stay out of his hair, and I'll get to see those grandkids. That was his dream. And I remember just 
hanging up the phone three years ago and thinking, that's just crazy talk. You know, like the likelihood that you're going to get a transplant is very slim and that everything's going to go right, very slim. And then you're going to somehow survive long enough to get your knee fixed and then you get your knee fixed. You know, it just felt like there was so many hurdles along the way, but that was his dream. Every time I talked to my brother, he would tell me his dream. Every time I talked to him, we're going to get a camper. And he'd tell me, there's a certain trail too that we want to hike in Wyoming. I'm like, you're going to hike somewhere? <laughs> really? I talked to my brother this Friday, two days ago. Three years ago, he had a, 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 a liver transplant. And, you know, we almost lost him. He went to the hospital. They basically said, hey, you know, they, they told him at the hospital, like, you're not going home. You're either going to get a transplant or you're going to pass. But this is the last stop. And by the grace of God and the prayers of our church family, I shared that with all you guys. We prayed for him. He was able to get a liver transplant. And then eventually, and it's not easy. Those of you that have friends, relatives, or you've been through a transplant, you know, the list of medications you have to take after that is a mile long. It's still hard. There's still challenges, but he was always optimistic, still dreaming about the future. Then he was able, despite all the odds, to go in and get his knee surgery done. So three years later, I talked to him on Friday. He says, Judd, we just bought a camper. <laughs> I kid you not. And he says, in two weeks, we're going to Wyoming for the next two months, and I'm going to see those grandkids. I was so emotional because it seemed so impossible. But when I hung the phone up, I was just reminded, look, you got to keep looking forward because if you keep, it was the dream that he made concrete, that was tangible, that he prayed about, that he kept in front of him, that kept him keep moving forward against impossible odds. What's your dream for this season in your life? What's your dream for this time period in your life? What are you thinking about? Number your days. Realize they're, they're precious and they're limited so that you make the most of your days. And then in everything you do, delight in God. Just delight in him every day because that will help you. Listen, we can dream about the future because we have a God who has been faithful to us in the past. And that gives us the confidence to move forward. Psalm 90, beginning of verse 15. This is so good. The psalmist goes on. He says to God, he says, give us gladness in what? Proportion. You see that? In proportion to our former misery. He's like, God, balance, balance it out. Take the former misery. Take the pain. He says, replace the evil years with good. Oh, this is, this is good. This is good, and this is powerful for us in our lives. God, take the pain that we've been through. Take the struggle that we've been through. How many of you have known some misery? How many of you have known some disappointment, right? How many of you have known some pain? It's been hard. Look, so some of you, you can't even count the tears that you've cried. You can't even put into words all that you've been through, even in this season. Yeah, you don't even want to think about this past year and all that you've lost. But here's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, God, take all that pain and all that hardship and all that difficulty and weave it all together and bless me in proportion to that with gladness. He's saying, God, give me a comeback. And I believe that God can give us a comeback. May he give you joy in proportion to your deepest disappointment. May he give you friendships in proportion to your loneliest season. May he give you, think about it, laughter in proportion to your toughest tears. May he give you opportunities in proportion to the biggest limits you've faced. May he give you um, uh, influence in proportion to their feelings that you've had of invisibility. Look, may he replace the evil years with good. He can bring it all back and then some. He can replace addiction with self-control. He can replace the chaos with peace. He can replace the oppression with advancement. He can replace dysfunction with order. 
He can replace all the evil years with good. Look, some of you right now, you say, I had it so bad. It was so bad. But if you follow God and delight in him with all your heart, he can take that so bad and turn it into so good in his time and his strength and his power. Just delight in him. Delight in him. You know, this week I was getting a haircut and I'm sitting there waiting and I had my headphones in, I had my phone out, you know, just killing time, public place, people are around, and, and I'm scrolling through, and on my feed is, a, is, a, is a, a pastor, communicator, and so I click on the feed, and I'm, I'm listening to this guy, he's talking about Psalm 23, and he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's an amazing part of, of Psalm 23. And he just starts to recount all the ways goodness and mercy have followed him all the ways of his life. And I'm sitting there around other people and I'm just having a moment. I don't know if you've ever kind of been, I got tears in my eyes. I'm thinking about God's goodness to me. I'm fighting really hard to not just stand up and do this, but I don't want to freak anybody out. Oh my God, you've been so good to me. I'm so unworthy. Your love has been so good to me. I'm just, you know, I'm waiting to get a haircut, y'all, but I'm having a moment. And I just, when I think about it, God has been so good to me. Through my addiction in my life, his goodness and mercy followed me. When I was a mess, his goodness and mercy followed me. When I was 22 years old and I sat on the steps of one of the first, second churches that I pastored and everything had blown up and gone crazy and I wanted to quit and I wanted to give up and I was just done and I tried to quit at that point, you know, like I was only 22 but I was done. Look, his goodness and his mercy, they follow me. Well, when I lost my mom, when I lost my dad, when I've lost loved ones, his goodness and his mercy still followed me. When I tried to go my own way and do my own thing, his goodness and mercy still followed me. And his goodness and mercy follow you as well. Think about it. Some of you, you face loss, you face layoffs, you face needs, you face addiction, you've been through abuse, you face rejection. Some of you, you've been so low. It's been so hard. You've faced so many difficult nights that you've just wanted to end it all. But his goodness and his mercy have followed you. His goodness and his mercy did not let you go. He's a good God and his goodness and mercy follow us in our lives followed you when you went your own way. It followed you when you rebelled. It followed you when you said things that were horrible that you regretted. His goodness and mercy has followed you this past year through COVID, through the shutdown, through the difficult season, through the unknowns, through the losses, through the pain, through the struggle. His goodness and mercy have followed you. And because of that, you can have confidence to dream again. Because a God who has been good to you and merciful to you through all of this is surely a God whose goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. If his goodness and mercy has followed me to here, his goodness and mercy can lead me there. I can dream again because I have a God who is good and filled with mercy and he will walk with me in my life. Our confidence is not in ourselves, it's in God. Our confidence is not in, you know, whatever science, the vaccine, the economy, politics. Our confidence is in God and who he is. His goodness and mercy has seen me through. And his goodness and mercy will see me through into the future. Psalmist in Psalm 90 verse 17 says this. He says, may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. You know, it's okay for you to pray and ask God to make your, your efforts successful, your business successful, your relationship successful, your family successful. It's okay to say, God, make our efforts successful. May man have your approval and make it successful in our lives. So 
So I want to encourage you. If you've been in the bunker, if you've been underground for a while, and it's time to dream again, it's time to move out of survival mode and move into comeback mode. Number your days so you don't waste your days and begin to think about the future and all God could do through you. Start to pray, God, I believe you're doing new things. Help me see it. Give me the eyes to see it so I can join you in what you're doing. Friends, today I'd like to end our service a little different. I'd love to just pray a blessing over you. I believe God's goodness and mercy not only has followed you, but can lead the way going into the future. I pray for you every day, every day. I pray for our church family. I pray for you. I ask God to protect you and move in your life, work in your life. But I want to pray for you publicly right now. And so I want to ask everybody to just bow their heads, clo close your eyes. If you just want to do something to, to kind of receive this prayer in your life, you can just open your palm, just open your hand where you're sitting just to say, God, I just, I receive this in my life. But God, I pray right now for our central family, for all those sitting here with open hearts and open hands. I pray that you will go before them and behind them. I pray that you will be beside them, work in them and through them, God. I pray you will bless them with love and joy and peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Bless them with all the things that money can't buy. Bless them with all the things that we really want in all the other things that we do. Fill their lives with your goodness and your mercy every single day. And God, I pray you'd bless them in their lives with what they need to take care of their families. Bless their businesses. Bless their, their ventures. Bless their careers. God, provide for them so that money is no longer a concern, so that finances are no longer such a worry, so that they can release that to you and walk in the freedom that comes from that. Bless them so that they have plenty to take care of their own and to bless others who are struggling as well. Bless them so that they can be great stewards of all that you give them in their life. God, I pray you move in their life financially. God, I pray for their kids either kids they've had or kids that they'll have one day. God, I pray you will bless those kids. Protect them and raise them up to be kids dedicated to you and sold out to you. Work in them and through them, God. Show those kids your unfair advantage and bless them in their lives. God, bless their marriages, their families, not only their kids, but their grandkids and their grandkids' kids. God, bless future generations and their life because of who you are. Father, I pray as we move into this new season that you will bless them with opportunities, opportunities all around them that they'll discover as they follow you and go after you and trust you in their lives. We thank you. We praise you. You're the God of goodness and mercy. You've been so good to us. And God, we hang on to you as we go forward into the future. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what an incredible experience. Remember that we go live every weekend, and it's a great way to meet and interact with so many of the Central family. For now, as you go on throughout this week, remember to hold on to Romans 8 that says, if God is for us, who can be against us? We'll see you next time.